So this is fun. I'm a little nervous, actually. Um, but hi, I'm Joanna. I'm going to say it again. Anyway, Joanna. That's how you say it. My last name was originally Smith, so my parents were like, let's be clever. We'll throw a Y in Joanna. So anyways, that's how my name's pronounced. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. OK, also I'm going to figure out how to talk into a microphone. Ooh. All right, let's see if this thing works. <laughs> how do I make the clicker work? This is great. <laughs> ah, perfect. We got stuff. All right, fun. We did it. OK, so um, I've been doing a lot of different things in the past 10 years. Um, at like 19 or something, I uh, started doing screen printing. I'm also nervous. I'm like shaking. Anyways, yeah. I know, right? Thank you. Yes. It goes away eventually, right? OK, cool. So yeah, I made t-shirts. Yeah, I made lots of t-shirts. Like I did uh, you know, screen printing, doing graphic design. So that's all related, I swear. Um, <laughs> so I've done that, and then after I did that for a bit, I was like, you know what, I really like graphic design. This is great. I'm going to go to school for that. So then I started working at a digital marketing firm that makes websites. Um, they weren't using WordPress, but then the next one I worked at, they were using WordPress. So I started using WordPress then. Um, yeah, so then from there, after a really long time, I was like, you know what, I really like code. I want to get into code. So there are a couple things that have shaped my outlook on typography, and one of them is printmaking, because you're able to look at the actual letter forms, you're able to see it actually printed. So moving from that into working with, like a, as a graphic designer making websites, and having these different responsive states where you, you have a breakpoint at, you know, however many places. I think at the time we were doing like six different breakpoints, which was really weird, especially coming from a design background, because you're like, oh man, I took all this time to lay out this beautiful type and put it in the right space. and make sure it's beautiful, and now it's going to get weird. And then sometimes, if it's a pixel or two bigger than the breakpoint, all of that type is going to look incredibly different. So that's a little bit of what's shaped my understanding of using the web and using typography. So from there, as a developer, I'm really, really interested in fluid typography. So that's the basic summary. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. This is great. Um, how do we make any of this work? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to, we're going with it. All right, so what we have in the middle is a printing press. And like I was saying, I've worked with print before. I've actually worked with something similar to this. And uh, this over here is a glyph. And it has a letter on top of it. And so what we used to do, what we used to do is we used to line up type. We would line it up, and then we'd put spacers between. And we would have all this ready to go, and then we would print on top of it. So this is kind of like where typography started to become what it is today. Because we started looking at these letter forms and really thinking about what are we making? Like, why is this readable? What are the different things we can do with it? How can we be really creative? And so a lot of the fundamentals come from the very beginning, whenever we were doing this, and we were laying out letters. So I'm going to geek out for a second. I don't know if you've heard of the hot metal typesetting but it's ridiculous. You basically have a keyboard, and you, it's, like a, it's basically like an old typewriter. And you hit these keys, and the blocks of letters come out into the machine and line up on this slug. And then hot metal is poured in the background of this machine. <laughs> and then afterwards, you have your line of type. And it's crazy for the time period that they were able to do this. There's totally a documentary on it. I watched it in design school, and it was really fun. So yeah. All right, so this is type. So what we're looking at are all these letters, and they have different ways of lining up. And we've learned a ton about the way we read and how we're able to take in information from this process. OK, so we're really excited about type. We're lining up things. We're thinking about stuff like grids and how these things fit together. And as we're doing it, we start to come up with all these different rules. And that's where you get design fundamentals. That's where you're pulling in, like, letting, kerning, tracking, all of that. All of those concepts come from this. So this is a baseline grid. It's one of the best things. <laughs> at one of the design firms I've worked at, um, I actually had to lay out like a 100-page book. And it was 
a lot of work. But one of the things that really saved me was the baseline grid. Because when you have a two column layout, having everything on the same baseline makes it easier for the reader. Your eye just tracks right over to the next line without there being as much trouble. So we're thinking about all of this. And there's a huge difference between legibility and readability. So the ability to distinguish letter forms, so like the difference between like a lowercase j or a lowercase p or a lowercase q and like all of the things that you're looking at, your eye is picking up on all of that. Um, that's why certain typefaces are definitely more uh, readable than others. But there's a difference between that and then there's and actually having type or design that affects the ability to make it understood. So there's a huge difference and your priority might really change the way you design something. Okay, so let's start talking about type. All right, so I've talked to you about the baseline. That's, that makes a lot of sense. And then there's also letting and kerning. So letting is the distance between the type and then kerning is the distance between each letter. So the reason why that's important is because certain things will be much harder to read than others based off of that letting. Um, and it's really important, especially at the time for newspapers and different books, making things accessible for everyone. All right, so here's tracking. Tracking is the distance between letters, and kerning is where you can precisely put two letters closer together based off of like the V and the A, that space is a little bit different. So going back to typography, going back to the different blocks that we're using and letterpress in general, um, what they had to do was put tiny pieces of lead in between everything. So because of that, we have a really strong understanding of what works and what doesn't work. So this is where we start to think about what we should do and what we shouldn't do as designers for people to be able to take away the information that you're wanting them to take away. And one of the things we talk about is line length. Like, if you've ever been on a website where you've literally had to turn your head to finish reading it, I'm not going to read that website for very long. I mean, maybe some people will, but that's just not a thing. It's the same for why they, we have double column layouts in print, or why whenever you're working on a book, you don't make your text span the entire page if it's a very large book. So these are all things we're learning. And OK, so this down here is what we call a display font. And basically, it's a font that's really interesting, has a lot to it, but it would be very taxing on your eyes to read lots of that display font for a long period of time because your brain has to take all of that information in. It has to take in all of those different letter forms, similar to what I just talked about. Legibility, readability, different things. So another problem is that if text is too small, it's hard to read because you can't see the shape of the letters. You're not able to distinguish your A senders and B senders. That's just the part that goes above and below the letter. So that's really frustrating. And if it's too big, it's hard to read because the horizontal flow isn't there. Your brain is just breaking up in tiny little pieces. So all of these concepts have been in print for a very long time. So as a designer, when you come into web and you're writing breakpoints you know, you're asking your developer to write breakpoints where your font goes down a couple sizes here and there, like for four devices. It's very frustrating because you feel like you have to let go of a lot of what makes design good design. Like you have to really be okay with sometimes your font looks like this and it's what, you know? So yeah, because basically it'd be like if you had a book and every single page in the book was a different size and you never change the font. So it all just gets really weird in and out. So we have taken a few things from design and regular typography standards into web. And they are letting, which is now called line height, and tracking, which is letter spacing. Um, so these work pretty well. It's kind of nice to be able to set these. But especially if you're working with letter spacing and you set like a unit that's standard, it's going to be that throughout the entire site, no matter the font size. Like it's going to be always so many pixels, which is a little bit weird. Okay, so the purpose of design, I'm just going to read the green text because I don't like reading, 
large things. Um, thought needs to be given to how a user, reader, viewer will approach the task of obtaining the information from the design. So a huge concept in design is user flow. And not user flow as in UX, like your actual eyes going down the page, where the hierarchy is, what you're supposed to be looking at, and how you're delivering that information. And using typography and using hierarchy, like headings, headings and things like that, that's how you get them moving through the page. It's how we know what to read and when to read it. All right, so I'm gonna show you some really great examples of typography on the web where it's done really well because I think that we are doing typography beautifully throughout the web. Um, and I'm not really talking about that exactly. But anyways, I love these because they look like print. It really looks like someone has a poster. And these, this is a, um, okay, so this is beautiful web type from Hello Happy, and it's using all Google fonts, so they're all free. And I love seeing that because, you know, you get really inspired by things that you know you can use, and that if you just have a little bit of design background, a little bit of ability, you can really make it look nice. Like, it looks like a very expensive typeface that somebody bought. Um, so yeah, so here's another example of that. Um, and I love this one in particular, because it really looks like a book. Like, wow, that's, that's on the web? That's so easy to read. Like, how does that respond, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's really an interesting thing. And of course, I have to end on Jean Simmons, Jen Simmons because um, her website is beautiful. The typography is gorgeous, and it really does look like a poster. Um, yeah. So, all right. Another thing that we've taken from print that we've put into web is ends, right? So when you see it in web, it's EN. But when we used it in print, we were taking the letter M and we were looking at the size of that letter, and that's a unit. Why would we want to do that? Because it's responsive. Whenever we had big blocks of type, the glyph with the letter on top of it, we wanted something that was relative to that typeface. We didn't want something that was a different typeface that might be a lot bigger and use that unit. We wanted something that would stay within that typeface that we could reuse. And so we came up with M's. M's are pretty great. So on the left is also an M, but the difference is that sometimes M's are full width and sometimes they aren't. And so that's one of the distinctions between M's in print and M's in, on the web because not every typeface has an M. <laughs> it didn't matter before the internet. But if we're taking M's into web, then yeah, we definitely need something that's not going to work. If we need something better, this is obviously not going to work for you know, Arabic and Chinese. So what we came up with was using a point size. And so the point size of the font, whatever that is, that is now what we call M's. OK, so I'm putting all this together. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> but I'm coming from print. I'm looking at web where we're using it now, like typography on the web. And I'm thinking, well, that's great. We actually have a relative unit. Like, we can actually use that for things. That's really interesting. So. Um, yeah, in CSS we use M's. This is just explaining it further. All right, but we also have REMs. So REMs versus M's, they're very different, right? So a REM is basing off, off of the root element, which is always going to be the same size. An M is basing it off of the element that it's inside, right? Okay, so let's walk this back for a second. Let's go back to our book, all right? Because basically we're designing for different books, right? So what we're saying is that type size can change, it can grow and shrink based off of the book, based off of the page of that book. So that's, what, that's why fluid type is so dynamic. Because you can set up a typographic scale. So that way, whenever you have like the smallest phone, your font is roughly the same size. So that really helps whenever we're sitting here, you know, as designers, like we're sitting at our desks, we're setting up hierarchy, we're putting it all together, we're trying our best to show like a user flow and get people moving through the page. And it'd be really great if all of that work was sustainable <laughs> or it just sustained it all, right? So this is from CSS Tricks. Um, and basically, I'll post all of these. But this is, there's a lot of different ways to do fluid typography. This is one of the methods that I really liked. So I know this is, the funny thing about it is it's just 
so obvious. Like, of course it should be doing that. We've not been doing this. <laughs> so anyway, it's great. It, the whole thing resizes. And so what's nice is the headline and the type, they're staying in proportion to one another. So I've experimented with this, uh, with this a little bit as well. Um, this is on my code pen. And basically, it just responds. So <laughs> this is justified type, <laughs> which is incredible to respond. <laughs> because the way that should work is it should just be reflowing, and you get these huge gaps in the paragraphs. That's what you should expect to see. But you don't see that at all. So if the whole thing is responding like this, right? If we've, we've gotten to this place finally where we're able to control this medium that's so fluid, it's so hard to handle as a designer, well, why not let's do it with images too? That's a background image. <laughs> and it's just responding. I'm not even like, it's the same size as the box. So the background size is just responding. So yeah, I think we've spent a lot of time <laughs> talking about design, and it was probably a little bit confusing. But this is basically all I have. I'm really excited about this. I'm excited about using fluid design and being able to just get things to do what they should have sort of already been doing in the first place. So yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll take questions. <laughs> uh. Oh, uh, well, it's on my code pen. Um, and then I also uh, have a portfolio on Behance still, I think. But most of my stuff is in code now. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, cool. Yeah, what? How, how would you describe the difference between breakpoints uh, and how that works versus what you're referencing in fluid design? OK, gotcha. Interesting. OK, so, so his question was, how, when I'm referencing breakpoints, like what's the difference between that and fluid design? OK, so the difference is you have a lot of different devices, right? And you can't really code for every single device. And when your font size is something that's static, it's always 24 pixels. It's going to be 24 pixels on something this big, and it's just going to wrap, right? That text is just going to wrap around, and you're going to have this giant font on this tiny device. Like, it's not going to change. So what you do is you go, oh, yeah, so for tiny devices from this break, this point to this point, I want all of these to be roughly this size. And that's kind of how we've walked around it, which sort of works, sort of works, unless you have a slightly outside of that looking font, and, or, well, slightly outside of that device that's going to not be at those breakpoints. And one of the biggest things that's kind of hard to explain is that the actual proportion between the heading and the rest of it, you want that to stay fluid. You want that to stay the same. Like when, when you're doing it, you, you put it at that point size on purpose for a reason. It's very much a specified thing. So yeah, maybe it'll change a little bit. But if it gets a lot smaller, then it's harder for you to see, like, is this what I'm supposed to be looking at? Is that what I'm supposed to be looking at? And it's not even just typography. You can do the entire thing. Like, you can do the entire module. You can have it just move up and down. Like, the entire box can move. And so when you're basing it off of something that's relative, it's way easier to get it to be fluid. I think that maybe answers it. I don't know. How does width play into that? Max widths? Like, using a max width? Yeah, so that's an interesting way to do it. Because like I said before, like, we're just going to go back. We should not be doing this. We should not be having line links that go all the way on a website. We should not be doing that. So <laughs> max widths are great. But that is awful. It's awful for reading. It's awful for people with glaucoma. It's awful for a lot of people. It's just making it harder for them to get to your content. Anyways, yeah, you can just do a max width. It can stop. It can grow and stop at a certain place and continue. It's, yeah. Yeah, 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 she's great. Yeah, it's gorgeous. 
Yes. No way, really. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, no, I have to go check that out. I'm, I love it so much. I'm such a geek about it. Like her stuff is just so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We need really good web typography. We do. Column, yeah, yeah, very smart. It's a really good way to do things. Yeah, once we start being able to utilize grid more widely, I think it'll help a lot of things. A lot more things can be more fluid with, with that. Yep. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'll tweet it out. I, I do my citations at the end, so I'll just tweet them out so you guys have them. Yeah, I'll put that in there, yeah, yeah. I could definitely answer to higher contrast. Not sure that it would be a screen reader thing. I think that really falls on the front end dev to make sure that they've put things in the right spots. Um, but yeah, no, for sure. We have, um, I think it's ADA compliant. You have to make sure that it's ADA compliant so that everything is in a great way. Like one of the things I think that people don't realize <laughs> is that really good type designers and really good type foundries spend a year working on a typeface one year and so when you're going to like the font or whatever what have you someone has just put that together and maybe they did a really good job you never know but they might not have so a lot of this stuff where we're looking at like really bad versions of this right where you get a typeface and because we don't have kerning we don't have the ability to just get different letters and put them together on the web I mean that would be insane um, because we don't have that, you get typefaces that just look awful. Like they'll just have too much space here, it's hard to read. So I think some of that's really related to accessibility because you want to make it as readable as possible. Right. Yeah. That's like the baseline. Yeah, for sure. It's always a balance between making it like beautiful and making it accessible. And I think that when you hit that sweet spot, you have a really gorgeous website. And a lot of people do really great work, but yeah. So I had thought about using percentages, like, so I have looked at that before. I'm a really a big fan of this method because you can set the, like, the tiny, like, the, you can set 320 and set your pixel size, and you can set your largest screen and set that pixel size, and it basically makes a scale using calc, and it's so nice. That's, that's kind of how I work as well. Yeah. But I've seen people using percentages, and I'm yeah. not sure, like, exactly if that's right. I'm not sure on that one either because I, I did look into it for like a half second and then I was just like, I don't know. I really like the being able to set it exactly and knowing what it will actually be because also <laughs> my designers are coming in and giving me pixel sizes. So it's kind of nice to just be able to use what they've designed and have it set and then set it. So what, what we've been doing a lot of is having calc on every header. So like every header might have a different size at different screen sizes and then on body. So really we're setting it a few places. but it's still going to have the same proportionate response. So, yeah. Cool, yeah? Do you think that there's ever a disadvantage to looking at the web through the context of like this came from print and that that yes. ever like limits how yes. people operate? I think, I think it definitely does. And there, I just listened to a podcast about that. I forgot which one it was. <laughs> oh, he, yeah, absolutely. He was asking if there's a disadvantage coming from print and looking at web as if it's print. And I, I really think that there is. I think we've done a lot of things. Like, it took us a long time to get to where web is now because we looked at it as if it was print. Like, we, we really, and I stress this all the time to my designers that I work with. I'm like, you have to stop making it a a width that stays the same all the time. Whatever element you're doing, you have to stop that. Stop making margins on websites. Nobody wants margins on websites. You know, like you know, like you take the page, you move it out, and then there's just big white bar down the page. Like, what is that? No, <laughs> you know, it's like we have in print, we have gutter. That's the middle part, portion of the book. Like, you don't want a gutter on a website. Like, come on. Like, 
Anyways, but, um, but yeah, so I think that there, there are things that have been done that are like detrimental, and then there are things that are really great, like bringing M's into web, I think is really smart, and making it something standardized, because not all languages have M's, you know, like that's great. Um, but I did just listen to a podcast about that, and I don't quite remember the one, but if I remember, I'll let you know. Yeah, uh, one of the things I like to tell them a lot is um, think about it as multiple grids, right? Because if you're a designer, like 101, use a grid, right? Like, and there are lots of grids, there are lots of beautiful grids that you can use. And I like to tell them, like, don't think about it just being like a half column, half column. Like, think about it being four columns. Oh, what if it's five columns, you know? Like, it's the web. You can literally do five columns and have it just flow. Like, it can just have, you know, four columns here and wherever else. Like, it can just scale and stack, basically. The biggest thing is scale and stack, I feel, because it's, it's hard for them to understand. I think the designer who I work with who understands it the best is the one who worked at the Apple Store first <laughs> and would just watch every year they slightly change the device, like a few pixels or whatever. And so he's like, yeah, no, I, I can't really just design something at a pixel size. Like, it's going to be something else tomorrow, you know? So, and there are all these different devices everywhere. So I think he understands it the best. And trying to think about it being like, try to think about it being a movable thing that can just completely grow. Like, instead of thinking about it always staying where it's at, think about it growing, and then starting with mobile. I think the biggest thing is starting with, like, mobile sizes. So anything that's movable that you can move around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Fun time. Thank <laughs> you.